Today we're going to discuss yet another anomaly in physics that to date does not have a very good explanation. But in this case, it's an anomaly that was discovered on top of the International Space Station roughly around 8 years ago, back in 2016. And it's a strange anomaly involving antimatter. But in order to understand all of this, we once again have to take a look at just a little bit of history just to understand how this all started and what exactly the scientists in this case were trying to discover. And so, hello info person, this is Anton. Today we're going to discuss some of the results from this study with a simple title, Fireball Anti-Nucleosynthesis, and basically discuss the idea behind what was potentially discovered on the International Space Station back in 2016 and a few years after that, and what this might actually mean for our understanding of the entire universe. But technically, our story starts with this person. You might not actually know who this is, but in physics, he's super famous. This is Samuel Ting, a Taiwanese-American physicist who was awarded a Nobel Prize in the 70s for discovering a certain type of a particle. I think there's a video in the description that talks about this a little bit more. And Dr. Ting had a kind of a dream. He wanted to create a device that's able to detect various types of antimatter and cosmic rays and send it to space. Because his hypothesis required a direct detection of various types of particles in outer space in order to see if he was actually correct. And he finally got to do this for the first time back in 1998 during the 91st mission of the space shuttle, but that attempt was really not enough. It was too short and it didn't actually discover much. And so he actually was pushing for something larger, more massive, and after years and years of trying, his team was finally able to create something known as AMS-2, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer 2, which was a type of a particle physics experiment that would be eventually mounted on the International Space Station. Obviously, it's one of many experiments currently present on the ISS. And technically, this was actually a relatively large magnet. It basically looked something like this. And on one side, it's able to accept different particles and antiparticles, and on the other side, it's able to see what passed through the magnet. And so, a typical particle is going to go to the left, a typical antiparticle is going to go to the right. And here this was just a matter of measuring the angle of deviation in order to determine the mass of the particle and antiparticle and then to discover what kind of a particle this actually was. And so this 8.5 metric ton magnet was actually one of the most, if not the most, impressive particle experiments in outer space. And it's now been active for over a decade, collecting a lot of data on a lot of different types of particles and specifically measuring antimatter, cosmic rays, and providing statistical data in order to start making certain conclusions. Specifically answering two major questions. One, why is it that we have so much more matter in the universe compared to antimatter? And more specifically, where is all of this antimatter potentially hiding? And two, well, what about dark matter? Is it possible that we can actually indirectly detect dark matter by finding certain types of antiparticles that were previously predicted by a lot of different ideas? And this turned out to be an extremely productive experiment. It's able to detect at least a thousand cosmic rays every single second, and it actually generates approximately one gigabyte of data per second pretty much at all times. And even by 2013, it already discovered enough positrons to potentially suggest that they were actually formed by the annihilation of dark matter particles somewhere out there, which was basically a kind of an indirect confirmation for the actual existence of dark matter particles. Now, this is obviously still a hypothesis, but the data here is super strong. But a much more important question here was in regards to antimatter. And specifically, the explanation for the asymmetry of antimatter, or the fact that matter seems to be everywhere, and antimatter seems to be extremely sparse. And well, pretty much right away, this experiment has physically shown us that our galaxy is definitely mostly matter. Most of the particles detected here were basically just matter particles, with just a few being antimatter particles. But this experiment was also looking for some weird particles like neutralinos and strangelets, just to see if we can actually find different explanations for what's actually going on out there. But even after just a few years, this experiment already provided us with some really cool data. For example, just the fact that it was able to detect cosmic rays. Here, by detecting so much cosmic radiation, it actually provided us with exact measurements needed in order to plan appropriate missions to, for example, Mars and beyond. 
Up until this point, the measurements were not as direct. But some of the first results in the first few years also discovered unusual excess of extremely high-energy positrons. So basically these high-energy antimatter particles. And it was actually this detection that initially led to the proposition that maybe we're actually seeing dark matter after all. Naturally though, not everyone agreed with this, and a lot of scientists realized that, well, it could also be just coming from some very powerful objects, such as, for example, famous pulsars. For example, we know that the Jaminga pulsar seems to produce a ridiculous amount of antimatter as well. But interestingly, while measuring all of this, and by the way, in the last 12 years, it was able to collect something like 230 billion cosmic ray detections, in this data, the scientists also discovered something nobody expected. Signals from what seems to be anti-helium, or essentially an anti-atom of helium. And that was surprising, and actually was initially predicted by Dr. Ting and why he wanted to conduct this experiment to begin with. His prediction was actually that any anti-helium nuclei would provide direct evidence for the existence of unusual antimatter islands or antimatter bundles in outer space potentially providing evidence for how the universe formed in the beginning and why we're not seeing antimatter more often. And here they were able to detect something like a dozen of anti-helium-3 particles, which contain two antiprotons and antineutron, but also a few anti-helium-4 protons. And though here on Earth, in various particle accelerators, anti-helium has also been produced, but usually only stayed stable for like a fraction of a second, in this case, on the International Space Station, it was detected because it somehow survived outer space, traveling for a very long time. And so this detection of anti-helium in space was technically a huge discovery. This was maybe a direct evidence for the existence of some kind of a stability island containing a bunch of antiparticles and something that might have existed since the Big Bang. And so what exactly was happening here and what did this detection mean? Well, as I mentioned, this was a bit of an anomaly and even today, after basically something like 10 years, it's still widely argued if this is indeed anti-helium. Now, the data does suggest it seems to be kind of similar to anti-helium, but I guess when it comes to this, the jury is still out. This would be a, a huge discovery, so it definitely has to have an absolutely definitive evidence involving multiple detections at all times. Right now, though, I think it's actually less than 20 out of 200 billion detections. But in this new study, researchers assume that the detection was real and wanted to investigate how it would be possible and what exactly it could come from. And here they focused on one thing, the ratio of anti-helium-3 to anti-helium-4. Because in theory, for every anti-helium-4 particle, we would probably see at least 10,000 anti-helium-3 particles. And in order to even produce these, these antiprotons and antineutrons would have to be close enough and traveling slowly enough to then somehow combine into a larger atom. But in this case, the ratio was different. For every single anti-helium-4, there were actually only two anti-helium-3. And that's way beyond what the standard model predicts. And so the main goal of the study was to basically try to explain how this could be possible and what could produce this after all. And they actually did manage to come up with an explanation that doesn't really break any physics and also takes us maybe a little bit closer to understanding dark matter once again. And here they explain this by using a kind of a hypothetical concept known as thermalized fireballs of standard model plasma. And for the lack of, I guess, better words, it's essentially a large explosion that seems to form when large chunks of concentrated dark matter, or I guess these huge clumps and huge clouds of dark matter traveling in the Milky Way, collide at very high velocities, resulting in sudden annihilation of a lot of dark matter particles, which produces these huge explosions, destroying a lot of things in the process. But more specifically, in this case, these unusual dark matter clouds would also be trapping a lot of antimatter particles, carrying them across the galaxy until they collide with something else. And so it's the collision that destabilizes these cloud formations, ends up releasing all of these antiparticles in various directions, which then basically end up clumping together and forming anti-helium. And so here, by modeling certain types of these fireballs, they were actually able to reproduce the exact observations from this particular experiment. 
And so these fireballs, which would represent very dense, very energetic regions of space containing large numbers of antiparticles, could definitely be the main source for these detections. And so at least in terms of theories of dark matter and the theories proposed by Dr. Ting several decades ago, this kind of all adds up really well. It essentially involves chunks of dark matter, concentrated antimatter, and the interaction between the two in order to then create these unusual anti-helium particles. But as I mentioned, this is still a very disputed hypothesis, and the official proof for this is probably not going to be available until a different experiment. And in this case, we actually have one planned really soon. This is a project by UCLA, and it's known as GAPS, General Antiparticle Spectrometer. And it's essentially a really large balloon that's going to be flying above Antarctica, detecting cosmic rays and antimatter once again. But here the goal is to find more anti-helium. And so if it's actually able to make very similar detections, it would definitely confirm all of this and potentially explain the anomaly of anti-helium detected by AMS-2 in the last 10 years. But even right now, just a few months ago, during the recent conference explaining the data from this experiment, the overall conclusion so far was that we might need to reevaluate certain ideas we have about the universe and certain ideas that try to explain cosmos and the universe as a whole. You can find the links to this conference somewhere in the description. And so overall, this is definitely something super exciting and hopefully we'll get more results really soon. Because whatever this means, it might finally help us explain everything once and for all. It might explain dark matter, antimatter, um, all kinds of other matter, and potentially explain how the universe formed as well, as one of the data from this experiment is confirmed by other experiments too. But until then, well, check out the links in the description, we'll definitely come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.